morning, and again, if you're visiting with us, you're an honored guest. We thank you for coming to worship God here at North Highlands, and uh, again, we'd ask for you to stick around for a little while afterwards so that we can shake your hand and greet you, and thank you personally for being with us this morning. If you have your smartphones or other devices, you can follow along uh, with the lesson on the YouVersion Bible app. There's questions there and uh, actually a poll uh, this morning that I'd love to have your input on, and as always, it is... uh, um, anonymous, uh, but I'd like to see uh, what the results are if you wouldn't mind uh, entering in uh, those questions and, uh, and answering the poll. <clears throat> on, um, on Twitter or on uh, Instagram, there is a hashtag that's called no filter, and the point of having no filter is to say that uh, what you're seeing in the picture that the person has posted, it has been posted without any kind of filter, without uh, changing the picture. Any. So, so what you're seeing in the picture that you find on Twitter or on Instagram is actually what that person is seeing, and here uh, in the last week, uh, my feed has been filled up with pic- pictures of people's feet and the beach on the other side of their feet. And I don't know if you've seen the same thing, but that's basically what's been filling mine up. And and they all say, hashtag no filter. And uh, so it's kind of been something I was thinking about. And I thought, you know what, I'd like to talk about some biblical truths with no filter. And so, and everybody's thinking, oh, great, what's, where is he going to go with this? Because the other thing that you think of when you think of no filter is people just saying stuff that maybe they should filter, right? <laughs> and so, but this is where we're going to look at some Bible truths and just consider some of these things w- with no filter. What does the Bible say? And is, is our faith in Christ being filtered somehow? I think it's a good question for us to ask and try to figure out, you know, is my faith just based on what God is saying or is my faith based on what I think God is saying? Is my faith uh, being shared in a way that I'm filtering it before someone else can receive it or am I just laying out there the truth that God would have me to share with other people that they might also have access to God with no filter? unfiltered relationship with God. And I want to encourage us to make sure as we go and teach and encourage and help others that we teach the Word of God with no filter, that we wouldn't filter it, that we wouldn't somehow try to keep it from having the full impact that it should have because the Bible teaches us that His Word is like a sharp-edged sword, that it pierces even the the bone and joints and marrows, but it also goes all the way to the soul. And that people can be saved when they hear the Word of God. That the Word of God is so powerful that it can change our hearts. And so this morning I want to encourage us to consider some truths with no filter. First, the fact that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Jesus is Lord and Savior. You know, too many people think that they can be their own Lord and their own Savior. and They come up with their own ways of doing things and say, you know what, I I know that the Bible says this, but I'd really rather do it my way. I'd rather follow my path and do things the way I think they ought to be done. You know, these people, they consider themselves to be basically good people, and they think that that is good enough. They say, you know what, I'm a good person. I don't hurt anyone else. God is surely pleased with the way that I live my life, and so because I don't offend anyone or I don't go out and purposely injure anyone, surely that's good enough. But the fact is, the Bible teaches us that there's more to life than just being a good person. In Acts chapter 10, we read about a guy who was a great person. His name was Cornelius. And how that he, he had given so much to all the poor people in his area. He had served them and helped them and lifted them up out of poverty. He had made a difference in so many people's lives. And it recognizes how good he was. And you know what it tells him? The, the Holy Spirit makes it clear He says, there's still something you must do. He still needed to submit to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. See, all people are sinners. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And we need to come to God on His terms and not our own. Jesus tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no way to access the glory of God except through through Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. There's no way for me to think that somehow I'm going to inherit the riches of heaven in eternity if I don't access those riches through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no other way for me to enjoy heaven except for 
to go through the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, it's in Christ that we find our worth. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, it says, For the love of Christ compels us. It's this love that Christ has given to us that compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. It's for Jesus that we should live. And we're compelled to live for Jesus when we realize what he has done for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, it says, For the love of Christ, I'm sorry, it it teaches us again how that we are to go closer to him. In in verse 21, one of second corinthians 5 it says for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of god in him it doesn't end with that we might become the righteousness of god that somehow because of who we are and just the fact that that this was done that we become the righteousness of god all of a sudden automatically without any other needed action it says no it's through him and it's by our accessing god through Jesus Christ, the Savior. You see, it's what Christ has done for us. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 17. 1 Peter 1, 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. You see what he says? It was for you. Jesus did all that he did for you. You know, the early Christians, they were not fed to wild beasts or dipped in wax and set ablaze on lamps in Nero's garden because they thought Jesus was a helpful life coach or or some kind of role model that they might want to follow some of his teachings. No, they realized Jesus was who he said he was, the Lord and Savior of the world. His authority strips away ideas of private religion because he's not simply a personal Lord and Savior. He is the creator. He is the Lord and Savior. He's the sustainer, the ruler, the redeemer, and the judge of all the earth. And now he commands everyone everywhere to repent. All the idols in this world are just shams. All power and authority, not only in heaven, but on earth, belong to Christ, the Lord and the Savior. He is your Lord and Savior. And you need to submit to his lordship and realize that he can save your soul from hell. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. It is Jesus Christ who is the Savior, and that truth needs to be shared with the world unfiltered, that they might come closer to God through Jesus Christ and enjoy all the blessings that we have. You know, as we read together in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, we talked about how that there is no prophecy of Scripture, is of any private interpretation, but that the Scripture came from the Holy Spirit as holy men were moved by Him. These are the words of God. And he has given them to us that we might have life and have life abundantly in this world. That we might have the best life that can be lived in this creation. And so let's revel in the truth of God. Let's enjoy the fact that we have the word, that we have the truth, and that we can now make it known to others. I want to encourage you with another unfiltered truth. We must submit to and obey Christ. It's not enough just to say, okay, I know that you're the Lord. I, I recognize that you're the Savior. It's not enough to have a, a, an intellectual uh, recognition of, of who he is and what he is. No, it takes more than that according to the Scriptures. You see, without our obedience to Christ, we will be lost. 
We will be lost for all eternity until we turn that uh, acknowledgement into action, until we do something about what we acknowledge and what we believe. In Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, it says, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, Jesus here, he commands baptism, but he also commanded for us to observe all the things that he taught. Now let's just consider that for a moment. To consider uh, that Jesus taught many things and to recognize, he's saying here, I want you to go into all the world. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says, and teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. He's speaking to these apostles, to these disciples who were physically with him at that time. And he tells them, you make sure everyone else knows what I've taught you. Now, he doesn't do this without giving them some aid. In John 16 and verse 13, we recognize he had told them how that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. The Holy Spirit would make sure that they were able to write down and give us the message of all those things that Christ wanted us to observe. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, in the Word of God, he makes it known to us. In John 17, 20 and 21, it says, As Jesus is praying here, he's already prayed for those disciples who were physically with him. And then he starts in this part of the prayer praying for those who will believe in him later. He's talking about us. And he says, I do not pray for these alone, those who are with him, but I also pray for those who will believe in me. How? Through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. It's through their word. And remember, their word is going to be guided by the Holy Spirit, according to John 16 and verse 30. And so here he's saying, I want you to tell them everything I've taught you. And then he tells them, I'm going to make sure that you're able to remember everything I've taught you, because the Holy Spirit will prompt you and will remind you and will give you the words to say. And then he says, as he's praying, I pray that they will believe in me through the word. It's the Word. It's going back to the Bible and listening to the unfiltered Word of God. It is through the words we read in the Bible that we know all those things that we must observe in our lives. In 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21, as we've already read, it says, this is the Word confirmed, which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. He says, this is the light of the world. This is what changes everything, is if you hear the words and submit to them. Not just hearing them, not just giving a a place to them, but actually doing them and obeying Christ in our lives. He tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and that it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work every good work what good work is not included in every good work i don't know they're all there it's all right there in the word and he's expressing it to us that we might then go and not only activate it in our life but that we would then teach others that they might have the same truth that they might then be able to live in the same faith based on the word of god in romans 16 25 It says, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now has been made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. You see, we're established by the preaching of Jesus because the gospel brings about obedience to the faith in our lives. It's not enough just to say, I believe. There must be obedience accompanying that belief. There must be an active Christian life that goes along with that faith. In fact, faith that is not active and obedient is not biblical faith. It's some other kind of faith. It's saying, I believe, but I'm not going to do anything about it. 
But biblical faith means that we are motivated, that we are compelled, as the Scripture said, to do something about what has been put in our heart by God. You see, we must submit to, we must obey Christ, and we must recognize that we obey those things that we find He has taught us through the Word. This is what Christ based this knowledge on in John 17. He says it's through the Word that we would understand. And so let's read the Bible. Let's study more often. Let's make a time and understand God's will for our lives and then put it to practice in our lives. Also this morning, if we want to enjoy our faith with no filter, we need to recognize that we have to obey Christ. And included in that obedience is membership in His church. Membership in his church is included in what he has taught us as we consider the things that he expects of us. You see, all believers should be one in Christ, as we've pointed out there in John 17. I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. He says, this is the the key here. He says, I want you to be one. And this is the unity that Jesus is praying for, for his people. And notice he says, that the world may believe that you sent me. Without unity in Christianity, the world will not believe. In fact, what we're seeing in our society today uh, as a slide away from faith, away from the truth of the gospel, uh, the way that folks don't take uh, faith seriously and don't uh, recognize how important it is to be a part of the church, the reason we're seeing this erosion of faith is because too many people have based their faith on something other than what the Word of God teaches. They've based it on some filtered version of the truth. They've rather than put their faith in God, they've put it in men who have made mistakes, who have led them in the wrong way, sometimes by by honest hearts, thinking they're doing good. But really what we needed was the unfiltered Word of God that we might just do exactly as He teaches and have restored New Testament Christianity here in our day and age. The unity that we are to have is not a unity that agrees to disagree. It's a unity just based on the Word of God. He says, as I are in you and you in me, as he's addressing God the Father, the Father and Jesus were one in everything Jesus said and everything Jesus did. And so he says for us to be unified in everything we say and in everything we do. But if this is true, why are so many churches teaching different doctrines Logically, the fact is we may all be wrong. That is logically possible for all of us to be wrong. But it's impossible for all of us to be right. It's impossible because God has given us one truth. And we can't all look at this and say, well, I take it this way. Well, I'll take it this way. I'll take it that way. I'll just take it the way I want to take it. No, he said he wants us to have unity. And if he prays for this, would he pray for something that we couldn't accomplish? Would he command us to do something that he knows we cannot do? We don't even do that to our children. We give them uh, instructions and we give them chores to do that we know they can accomplish because we recognize their abilities. Who better than God to recognize our abilities? to recognize what we can and cannot do. He knows our limitations. And so he gives us a command that we would have unity. And he goes even beyond that through the Holy Spirit in giving even more commands about the church and about how unity is to be established and held onto and kept in the church. Look with me, if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. And I encourage you, highlight this scripture and use this scripture every single day in trying to help others understand that in the churches of Christ, we're trying to call people out of filtered religion, out of filtered faith, into an unfiltered faith in the Word of God, in Jesus Christ alone. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, it says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Would he beg us to do something that we can't do? Well, no. He's the God of the universe. He designed us. He knows what we're capable of. And he says, I want there to be no divisions. What's a denomination? A denomination is a division of a whole 
here we go, back to school, right? You got your fractions, you got a number on top, you got a number on the bottom, you got the line in between, you got the fraction, right? And when you fraction something, you divide it. You take a pizza and you cut it up into eight different pieces. You've got a denominations of the pizza. You can't do that to the body of Christ, according to the Bible. He says, I don't want any part of this. I don't want you to divide up. I don't want you to cut it up. I want you to have unity. I want you to say and do the same things, just like Jesus and God has always and have always said and done the same things. In 1 Corinthians 4, 17, uh, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he goes on and he says, for this reason I've sent Timothy to, to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ, and listen, as I teach everywhere in every church. Every church, all of them with the same doctrine, all of them following the same plan, all of them following the same Lord, unfiltered by man's destructive heresies, by man's destructive additions to the word, instead just following the pure word of God. He says it again in, in uh, chapter 7 in verse 17. He says, as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk, and so I ordain in all the churches. All the churches carried the same doctrine that we read about in the Bible. All of them. At some point in time in church history, man decided to insert his opinions. Man decided to, to change and to filter God's truth to the people. We have the fall. The, uh, the fall of religion, the fall of the church, when the church tries to tell people what they should do rather than allowing the people to have access to God themselves and understand what his will is for their lives. You see, Jesus didn't pray for something that cannot be done, but it requires obedience. It requires that Christians preach the word as we're instructed in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, to preach the word of God with no filter. Just preach the word. Just let the word of God do its work in the hearts and minds of those who you love. Why no filter? Why wouldn't we uh, insert a filter. The fact is, the reason we do these filters, the reason we come up with these ways of, uh, of changing the Word of God is we're fearful. We're fearful of how it's going to offend someone who we love, and, and we don't want to cause a break in our friendship. We don't want to uh, cause to, them to be pushed away somehow, and so we think, oh, well, I better not say it this way. I better not just let them hear the Word of God. I, I've got to somehow get in between them and God and, and make it softer, make it feel better, make them happy about it. You know what? They'll be happiest if they're saved. They'll be happiest if they're right with God in the end. And the worst possible situation that we could find ourselves in is on the day of judgment to stand before God and have a friend who looks you in the eye and says, why didn't you tell me? And you say, well, I, I kind of did. They said, yeah, but you didn't say it like this. I'm going to hell because you didn't tell me that I needed to change because you didn't tell me you got to stop this behavior. That's what's going to happen on the day of judgment. I would much rather go through this life knowing I have given all that I can and said what needed to be said, unfiltered, pure, and undefiled, the Word of God being given to the hearts of those who I love so that on the day of judgment they can look at me and say, thank you, I know you tried. Thank you, I know that you told me what God had for me to know and, and I'm sorry I didn't obey it. And we need to reach out to them with the truth because the day is coming. What happens if we teach more or less than what God says? What happens to us if we give in to this idea of perverting the gospel of Christ? It's been done in the past. In Galatians chapter 1, we read about it. P Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Then notice what he says, which is not another. So it's not a different gospel completely, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So he just, they just want to filter it a little bit. They just want to change it a little bit. Instead of preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, they're going to preach the life of Christ, which is still powerful and which is still wonderful. But the power of God for salvation is in the death, burial, and the resurrection, not in the life, as wonderful as the life is. And so they just pervert it just a little bit. And let's talk about the life of Christ rather than his, the, the powerful death, burial, and resurrection. It says it's not another, but they want to pervert the gospel of Christ. In verse 8, he says, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. And as we've said before, we say it again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, he is cursed. 
No, we've got to preach the truth. And if we don't preach the truth, 2 John verses 9 and 10 tells us the outcome. It says, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ. If you don't teach what the Bible says, if you add your filters to what God has said, he said, if you transgress, do not abide in the doctrine of Christ, you do not have God. How much more plain can he be? How much un more unfiltered can he be? This is God's word with no filter. He says you don't have God if you go beyond the teachings of God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house. Do not even greet him. Folks, we've got to stand on the word of God. And we've got to help others stand on the word of God also. And until we do stand on the word of God, we will continue to see churches shrinking. We will continue to see our loved ones falling away. We will continue to see drugs take its effect on the life of a person who once had believed in Christ and had put their faith in him. We'll continue to see divorce ravish our families because of the unfaithfulness of one or another Christian. We'll continue to see our society crumble before us until we individually, personally, take on the holiness that God demands of us individually and personally. That we would return to his word and that we would become serious about what God expects in our lives. He tells us if we teach more or less than God's word, then we don't have God. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, he tells us what comes to those who don't have God. He says, I'll give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, and what's he going to do when he returns? Taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. It's hell. It's everlasting destruction in hell for all eternity. That's where a soul is headed without obedience to Christ, without a knowledge of God, and without then going and teaching an unfiltered message from God. But how can our friends have God when they're being taught more or less than God's Word? They can't. They can't. We can't. If we continue to accept and believe and, and allow to go on the false teachings and the filtered uh, that, that are, are given in the place of God's Word, then we will not enjoy the salvation of God. So let's teach them the pure and unfiltered Word of God. And the gospel with no filter is found in Romans, uh, well, it's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. But notice what Romans 1, 16 and 17 says about that gospel that has no filter. It tells us there that uh, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. He said it's in the gospel that all of God's power has been placed to save mankind. This is where God's power to save is. So we must come to the gospel. We must understand the gospel. And he explains exactly what it is through the power of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I uh, preached to you, which you also received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I delivered to you, first of all, this gospel which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth when it comes to the gospel. An unfiltered, an undiluted gospel of Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So the gospel preached with no filter is what we have. You know, on the day of Pentecost, Pentecost uh, Peter preached the gospel. He had preached the sermon and he told him about Jesus and who he really was. And he explained exactly what had happened when these people crucified Christ. And the crowd who was listening to him, they were cut to the heart, it says in Acts 2 and verse 37. It says they were cut to their heart, and they asked Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, brethren, what shall we do? And then he preached the gospel to them with no filter. He said in verse 38, repent 
and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if we want to preach the gospel unfiltered, that's what we'll answer to. Just give the same answer that we read in the Bible. Just say exactly what the Holy Spirit says to say, because that's what Jesus told us to do when he was praying his prayer. In John 17, he said, it's through their word. And I want you to teach them to observe all things I've commanded you. And he wants us to do it through the word because it's their words inspired by the Holy Spirit that we now have in our hands and that we can now give to others that they might also have the gospel with no filter and that they might also come to a relationship with God through the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because there is no other way. I want to encourage you this morning. If you are not a Christian, if you have not obeyed the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection, you can do it today. And you should do it today. You can repent. And that's what the beginning of the gospel is for you. Spiritually dying to sin in repentance. Saying, I, I used to live this way, but now I'm going to live this way. That is a death that occurs spiritually in our heart. That we end a life of sin and we begin a life of righteousness. Repent the death of Christ that we would then be buried in a watery grave, the burial of Christ, that we would go down into that watery grave, a sinful person, but then we would be risen up out of that watery grave, a saved person, a Christian, one who can then walk in the ways of Christ as it's described in Romans chapter six, one through four. Won't you do that today? Won't you have your sins washed away by the blood of the lamb? Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And so that Jesus Christ can save you in the end. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Have you obeyed it? If you haven't, please come while we stand and we sing this song. Early upon your ear, sweet his cry of love and pity calleth. Turn and listen, stay and hear. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Take his yoke, for he is meek and lowly, Burden to him turn. He who calleth is the master holy. He will teach if you will learn. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Then his loving, tender voice obeying, bear his yoke, his burden take. Find the yoke his hand is on you laying, easy for his sake. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest.